Love and marriage, love and marriage Go together like a horse and carriage This I tell you, brother You can't have one without the other Love and marriage, love and marriage Go together like a horse and carriage Dad was told by mother A scenario where the church, where the parents in the church, where we take responsibility for training our young people, where we take responsibility for making sure that they know everything that they're going to need to know to be successful in this world. We teach them right, we teach them wrong, we teach them how to behave, we teach them about Jesus, we teach them about love, um, we teach them how to be parents, we teach them about money, we, 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 we teach them how to live their lives in a way that glorifies God. But we take one single area and we say, we aren't going to teach our children, we're not going to teach our young people about this. Instead, what we're going to choose to do is in this one area, we're going to let Satan do the training. And we're going to let Satan do the educating in this one area. We'll do everything else, but this one area, we're just going to let Satan educate them. And I'm afraid, church family, this is what we have done with the area of sex in our churches and within our Christian community. Somewhere along the line, we've decided that this is an area that's too sensitive, too volatile for us to touch. And in our silence, what we have done is we have failed to bring Christ into the conversation. And our failure to bring Christ into the conversation with our young people and to make it a regular part of our conversations in the church, what we have essentially done is we have handed over this process to Satan. And some of you this morning are even a little bit uncomfortable that I'm going to be speaking on a subject like sex. And some of you are going to be uncomfortable even that we have some some teenagers in the room because, I mean, they're not ready to hear this yet. Newsflash, we are in a world of information right now. The internet is bringing tremendous amounts of information into your homes, into your children's lives. They have more information on their cell phones than any library you have ever been to. And it is more searchable and the information is more available to them than what many of you could have ever imagined even a few years ago. And what I am finding as a pastor on a regular basis is that we have kindergartners, first graders, second graders who have being exposed to sexual conversations, being exposed to sexual content that many of us can't even fathom or imagine. But right now, for our young parents, this is their reality. And I'll be honest with you. Some of you are going to say, well, it's not good for young kids to be hearing about sex. It's not good for young kids to be exposed to this because their brains aren't ready for it. They're not ready to handle it. You're absolutely right. I would prefer that they not. But the truth is, they go to school and they're finding out on the playgrounds and this is what they're, being, what, what, what they're talking about. This is what they're being told. And the, the information they're receiving, it's not healthy. It's not good. They are getting a completely perverted understanding of what sex is. And as a church, especially going back to the 80s and 90s, we decided we were going to get out the word to sex and we were going to talk to our teenagers about sex but do what our message primarily was sex is gross it's nasty it's yucky you need to stay away from it it's 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 this horrible thing that you don't want to do I mean save that for your for your for your spouse wait till you're married and let them deal with the messy yucky stuff and so we we have a problem within our society right now to where We have on one side, we have a society that has taken sex and has said sex is God. It's something that we worship in place of God. It's something that we live our lives 
before in our lives to have, and we can enjoy it in so many different ways within the context of our society today. But then, on the other side, we have a church that's saying sex is gross, especially to our young people and to our teenagers, and they're carrying it with them for the rest of their lives, and we're saying it's gross, it's nasty, it's yucky, it's something that you know, you're, you're better off just not talking about, but do it as little as you have to in the confines of your marriage, because yuck. But this morning, what I really want to do is I want to come back and I want to talk about sex as a gift. And the way God intended sex to be used, and to be honest with you, I've realized as I've been preparing for this over the last couple of weeks, I'm biting off more than I can chew this, this morning. Really, this is probably something that needs to be panned out over the course of, you know, several Sundays. Because of the amount of misunderstanding that exists in our societies and our churches about what sex is supposed to be, about what sex can be. But here's what scares me the most, is in, in John chapter 1, we hear Jesus and Jesus coming into the world as a, Jesus being light that's coming into darkness. And we understand darkness and evil being the same as good and light being the same. And darkness is essentially the absence of light. And so light can never overcome darkness. If you put light and air into darkness, the light will always shine through the darkness. The darkness can over, never overtake the light. The same thing is true of evil. Evil is the, where the good does not exist, and good as we know in our world is God. And so evil is where God does not exist. And, and, and church family, I, I, what I want to do this morning is I think that we have chosen and we have allowed sex to live in darkness. We have allowed evil to control our understanding for us as adult church members and for our kids of what sex is. And my goal this morning is to take God, His Word, His teachings, and to insert it into that evil. And my desire is that as it is illuminated, that what God's Word says is true is that darkness and evil will not be able to overcome the truth. And for some of you, this is going to start the process of liberation for you from sexual assault, from issues that you've had from your past, reality check, almost every single one of your kids, if, if they are younger than me, are probably suffering from some of the same issues that you would see from somebody who is a sexual, who's been sexually abused, because the chances are they have been exposed to sexual material at a young age, which is sexual abuse, and that they... Your, your young children, your young daughters have seen pictures, have seen videos of inappropriate pornography and women that they identify with in sexual situations. Same thing for your young men. They are identifying with men in sexual situations through pornography. And they say, well, this isn't my kids. If your kid is ever around another kid with a cell phone, chances are it's your kid too. And it doesn't take long for it to happen. You're, you're going to be naive if you say, not my kid, not my grandkid. They are, they are struggling like somebody who's going to struggle with sex as if they have been sexually abused. It's, it's just the reality of it today. And as a pastor, whenever I deal with younger people, I deal with it. There, a, another thing that I have to deal with as a pastor is I assume that pretty much every man that I come in contact with has a pornography addiction. And you know, it just isn't men anymore. A growing number of women not only view pornography, but also have a pornography addiction themselves. And chances are the vast majority of you that are in, your, in this room have the same problem. You say, well, that's not fair. I mean, we're in church, that can't be. There have been a number of private studies done where pastors were able to speak openly and honest about their pornography use. And the numbers come back as high as 80% of pastors on a semi-regular basis are viewing pornography. We need to read some scripture. Okay, Genesis. 
chapter 2. Let's go back to the beginning. And you may not have ever realized this, but this is absolutely one of the funniest verses in the whole Bible. And I, this morning, I, I want to show you why this is so funny. For some of you women, you're going to look at this and you're going to say, this proves that God is a man. Okay, so verse, chapter 2, verse 18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper for his compliment. So the Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky and brought each of them to man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, and to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found as his compliment. Imagine that. Verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs, closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this one at last is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and is one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This is why man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. I don't know if you guys have ever read that and really understood what happened here. God has created man, and God has said man is alone. God needs a helper. God needs companionship. God needs somebody that, you know, he can't spend his life with. And so then God started creating animals. God creates a goat, presents the goat to Adam. And Adam looks at it and says, I see he goat, I see she goat. Next. And God makes a pig and sends the pigs to Adam and says, is this going to be a partner for you? And Adam looks at him and says, I will call that pig. And I will name that he shig, that he pig, and she pig. And then, you know, these key animals keep coming by. And he's like, that's a he elephant, and that's a she elephant. And they, they keep coming by. And, you know, sooner or later, God finally starts to figure out, none of these are going to work. And Adam's looking around, and he goes, I see he giraffe, I see she giraffe, I, I, I see he sheep and I see she sheep, but I'm a he. They have companionship, they are like getting along well together and I'm by myself. This is sad, isn't it? I mean, this is Adam and, I, and God created all these animals and he's like, pick one of them to be your companion, pick one of them to live your life with. And none of them quite work out. And so then we see here that God puts Adam in a deep sleep and he forms woman. And I, I, I love this. I mean, can you, I, 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 this is an awesome picture. I mean, this is, he, he takes his rib, creates this woman. And it, I don't mean this to be negative in any sense of the, the word ladies, but it sounds like God presents woman the same way he presented all the other animals. And he's like, what do you think about this one? You didn't like the pig. You didn't like the sheep. You didn't like the goat. You didn't like the giraffe. You didn't like the elephant. How about this? I mean, and you just kind of get this idea that Adam's just like, whoa! Whoa! Look at this. And he's like, whoa, man. Like, she is, this is what I'm talking about, God. This is what I've been waiting for. I didn't like anything else you brought. All the rest of your creation is good, but this is, this is good. Thumbs up. Good job. And he goes on and says, I'm going to call her a woman because she came from me. And, that, and then God goes on, the scripture goes on to tell us, you know, that, and God tells us, he says, this is why man leaves his father and mother and bonds, we will come back to that word bonds in just a minute, with his wife and they become one flesh. This, this word bond here is so important. And this is what sex is. I've had young people come up to me sometimes and they'll especially who aren't married and sometimes a guy, sometimes a girl and they're like, you know, I just, I just want to find a spouse that I can be friends with. Like, we just want to be friends and, you know, we just want to like each other. And Like, I know people talk about sex and that kind of stuff in marriage, but, you know, is it, is it really that big of a deal? Like, I don't, and I'm like, sex and marriage go together. 
Like I, I, any marital counseling you go through, anytime you go and talk to a pastor, anytime you go and talk to another single pastor, and you're talking about your marriage and the strength of your marriage, not because we're perverts, but do you want the questions we're always going to want to know? What's happening in the bed? What's going on in the bedroom? I mean, it's great that you guys are friends and you talk and you guys like each other, but what happens in the bedroom not necessarily affects everything else, but everything that's in your marriage affects what happens in the bedroom. And if things are not going well in the met bedroom, chances are there's some other things that we need to be looking at and we need to be working with. But he says here this bond, and the bond here that he's talking about, I believe, is sex. And we know from talking about, you know, from learning sex and the, and the things that we've learned about it from a clinical science aspect is that whenever you have sex, there are chemicals released in your body and your brain that give a chemical reaction that's similar to, to cocaine or heroin. And it's just an extreme excitement and your brain is just going crazy. And what happens is that during that sex act, they the images and the one that you're with, all that's getting seared together. You know how heroin and cocaine can be addictive and you keep getting drawn back to them? In a good sexual relationship, in a good marriage, whenever you have that bond together through sex and it's in a healthy way, those chemicals and all those things that get kicked off, they make you, in a sense, addicted to your spouse. You want to keep coming back to them. You want to keep being with them. And now this morning, in order to help us understand this, I brought an expert in this area um, with us this morning who is going to teach us more about how all this works. Uh, Bill Kilman, can you come up here real quick? Come here, Bill. Bill's a, an expert in adhesion. Okay. Bill, are you an expert in this area and able to tell us about this and help us understand it? I am not an expert in sex. I am an expert in welding, which, oh. is, which is adhesions of metal. Oh, sorry, Maria. Okay. So, so adhesions of metal. This isn't nearly as exciting what we're talking about, but we'll go there since that's what you're an expert in. Um, I, said, I, I asked you if you like, knew about bonds and how things got connected together and could stay together, and you said yes. And so, so talk to us just a little bit about in the welding process. Uh, Bill you is a retired, uh, was it pipe fitter? Welder, welder where you, you weld things together in metal. So, so tell us about what that process and what that looks like and how two metals become like one metal or something. Well, uh, you have to have electricity if you're welding with a welding rod. And you need electricity for your marriage, too. Yes, okay. Okay, keep going. And, that, and the welding rod is, uh, has to be a metal that's above the tensile strength of the metal that you're welding. What's tensile? Tensile strength is um, common steel is probably in the 50, uh, low 50,000 thing. The welding rod you use be... 60,000 up, so it's higher in the tensile strength. The tensile strength is, it won't break apart before the parent metal. Okay. Oh, so now we have parents and, okay, gotcha. Keep going. That happens too in this whole conversation. You know more about this than you think, Bill. Keep going. I don't know what you want me to say next. So, if, tell us the characteristics of a good weld characteristics of a good weld is there's no voids. Ooh. Okay. If, there's, if there's no voids, then there's nowhere for it to leak or break. Okay. What would cause the voids or a poor weld? Um, not doing it correctly. Very good. So, uh, this, this, this voids and, and, this, and this welds, how do you, are there ways to, to, to determine or to tell if the weld is good or, or poor? Yes, there's ways. There's, um, uh, if you take a test to make sure you, that, that your employer knows you can weld, they'll bend the metal, and if it doesn't break, then it's good. And if you're on, out in the field doing the welds, they'll x-ray it, and that x-ray will declare if there's any voids or not in it. Okay. 
One of the things I find interesting, I've talked to you about welding over the years, is that you've mentioned to me that the area of the weld, and I think this may go back to tensile strength. Um, I really, I don't know much about this stuff, to be honest with you people. Um, but the, the, the tensile strength of the, the weld, that if the, the pipe were to break or to be damaged in some area, typically you're not, in a good weld, you're not going to the, see the damage in the weld. No, the parent metal will go first. And the parent metal is the two, parent, the, the two metals you're binding Correct. together. And those have a greater chance of breaking. And so, so essentially what you've done, if the weld is good, and it's a good weld, then that weld is going to be, is going to bind those two together essentially. Yes. Are, are there ways to make a bad weld look good? Yeah, a bad weld. I mean, I'm sure you never did this. If the bad but weld other is, people you know. Because the bad weld doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't have, if you know the bad well, did, you didn't do a good job and you pro probably got voids in there, you can just make the, the cap, that's the final pass, look real nice, okay? But that won't help the well be stronger. It'll just make people think, oh, that's a good well. Very good. So if we, if we take this between, we have to make a connection somewhere between pipe fitting and sex because that's what we're talking about. You understand that, right? I understand that. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I understand. <laughs> Here in the scripture, God's telling us that the two separate entities are going to be bonded together. And they're going to be made one flesh. If this is how two metals are brought together to become one. Do you think God is capable to create a bond that would be very interesting? Do, do you think it would be possible, or do you think it would be, I mean, do you think God would be able to create a bond that could connect our marriage with that same type of strength in order to bring two people together? Absolutely. God can, what God creates is always right. That's a good answer. All right, thank you, Bill. And it's, uh, I, But I brought Bill up here because I really wanted to make that clear. And I wanted you guys to have a, a, a visual. Is this is what sex does in a healthy, good marriage. That it, it brings two different people together and bonds them together. And because of the different chemicals that are released and everything else within our, 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 our body um, at this time, that it connects us together. God doesn't tell us all this here. We've learned from science later on how powerful this bond can be. But what's happened in our societies is that this bond is a strong bond. And we tend to be way too loose with it. And what happens is if you are not married and you are having sex outside of marriage, then you are bonding yourself to somebody else. And that what you are doing is that you are making yourself one flesh with somebody that is not meant to be one flesh with you. And let me be very, very clear on this. There is no kind of marriage. There is nothing that's like marriage. There is either marriage or there is not marriage. You are either married or you are not married. And we play around with this too much in our society where we think that sex is simply a recreational activity. This is what the world tells us. This is what TV tells us. And right here, God is telling us that sex is a bond that joins you together for the rest of your time here on earth. It is that powerful. It is that strong. And what I believe part of the reason why our relationships are struggling is because too many people and too many young people and too many older people, let's not just pick on young people now, are too careless with sex. And we know from other places of scripture that sexual morality goes beyond just simply the sex act with somebody, but it also goes into fantasizing about sexual acts with somebody else. And young people, 
You may say, well, we're not having sex. If you are doing sex-like things with somebody else, that same type of bond is being created. And what you're going to have to do at some point in time is break that. And it's kind of like a piece of tape. It sticks real good the first time. Then you pull that piece of tape off. You try to stick it to something else. It's going to stick a little bit better. But then sooner or later, the strength of that bond isn't going to be there anymore. And it also happens as you are watching pornography. Some of you, even within your marriages, you are watching pornography. And what you are doing is that you are bonding yourself to somebody or something else that is not your spouse. And you are going to weaken that bond between you and your spouse. This stuff is very, very dangerous because the weld and the bond we're talking about is supposed to be stronger than the two individuals themselves in order to bring them together as one flesh, just like what Bill was talking about. But we're taking that same bond and we're just going around and sticking ourselves with whatever we feel like and whoever we feel like. And then we wonder why when we finally do get married that there's a problem. It's because we are bringing bringing years and years and years of inappropriate connections and bonds into our relationship. Before I move on to the passage in 1 Corinthians, let me say this real quick, because some of you guys are going to be thinking of this question. You're going to say, well, what about me? You know, I'm, I'm not married to me, my, my spouse, or who I hope will be my spouse. You know, it's not going to be the first person I've had sex with. This was the same situation with me. And you're going to say, well, what, can I be made right again? Can I be forgiven? You know, what, what can happen here? The, the truth of the reality is, I, I, I want to be honest with you, can God forgive you? Yes, absolutely, he will if you seek his forgiveness through Jesus Christ. But we know from scripture that sexual morality is a sin against our body. And even though we can be forgiven by Christ, there are still consequences for our sins. And I believe that sex is the same way. God can forgive us, he can help to make us whole, he can can help to make it better, but you're still going to have sins that you have committed against your spouse already. Just not against God, but sins you've committed against your spouse and against yourself. And the, the, the truth of the matter is, I believe that those are still going to follow you. And those are still going to be there. But you can do things to help make it better. But it starts off with seeking forgiveness for yourself. And also, at some point in time, young people you're going to have to ask forgiveness of your spouse if you are acting inappropriately sexually before you're married. You're going to have to go to your spouse and you're going to have to ask them for forgiveness as well for the sins that you committed against them. Passage in in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. It says, Now in response to the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have relations with a woman. But because sexual morality is so common, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. A husband should fulfill his marital responsibility to his wife and likewise a wife to her husband. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but the husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. Do not deprive one another sexually except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again. Otherwise, Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say the following as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all people were just like me, but each has his own gift from God, one person in this way and another in that way. Paul is reiterating what I said earlier. That sex is not just simply a side aspect of marriage, but sex is an important, integral aspect within marriage. And because it's so important within marriage, we need to handle it appropriately outside of marriage. But the thing I want you to see here as you look at it is that Paul doesn't describe sex as God and Paul doesn't describe sex as gross, but rather what Paul does is Paul's describing sex here as a gift. We're going back to the bond idea. And what Paul is saying here is Paul is saying, be bonded together regularly within your marriages. Be bonded together regularly within your marriages. This is a gift and that this is something that God intends within the scope of marriage to happen 
on a significant regular basis. He even says here, he says, do not deprive one another sexually, except whenever you both agree on it for a certain period of time. And then to come back together after that. And, and I meet too many couples within Christianity where, and sometimes I think the church oftentimes is to blame for this, where we have made, gross, we've made sex to become something so gross and something that people don't want to do that they start trying to avoid it and it starts to affect their marriages because they're starting to deprive each other, one another sexually. But Paul is saying here that this is important, that this is a bond that should regularly be being created and that you can see because of the, as I talked about earlier, the, the bond, the things that are coming up, the, the connection that's made, how important that becomes. And it really does become a gift. And what I would like you to do more than anything else this morning is to change your concept of sex as something that is a physical aspect is something that is an act of worship. And in our society today, we have taken sex and that we have made it a physical connection between two people. And we've made it simply down to a physical aspect. But I believe that sex has very much a spiritual aspect to it as well. And if we just simply degrade sex down to where it's just physical then we are going to miss the beauty that can be found within sex because sex, I believe, is also very much spiritual. And sex within the marriage, within the confines of marriage, I believe that is the opportunity for a husband and wife to interact with each other in a way that is worshiping God. And for some of you, you're, you're struggling with your concepts of sex within your marriage and you want to be good to God and you want to be good to your spouse, but this isn't working, it's because for some of you, you simply made it physical. For some of you, you have seen sex as God and that you have been watching pornography, you've had other sexual relations outside of your spouse and whenever you come to your marriage bed, you want your spouse to fulfill the things that other people have fulfilled for you or you want your spouse to fulfill the things that you have seen on your computer screen. And you want them to do those things for you. And what you are doing, if you've made sex God and you want your spouse to become part of your idol worship as they serve you. And it becomes about you wanting them to do something for you physically. And others of you, you've made sex gross and you want to avoid it and you want to stay away from it because it just it doesn't make you feel good. But either one of those two extremes, I believe, is a sin whenever we go back to Scripture. And my desire is to see more of our marriage come together where the husband and the wife see sex as a gift to be enjoyed for both. And I believe for some of you that this is going to change your sexual relationships with your spouse if you can hear these things. And it's going to seem really, really awkward. And it's going to seem weird, but I think it's so important because not only for you, but also for your family. It's necessary for you to have a healthy sexual relationship. Whenever my grandparents were old, I guess grandparents in necessity are old, so if you're grandparents, you might just be old, but my grandparents were like old, old, um, and they were going to like a, a nursing home, and we were... Uh, and we were packing up everything in their house and my job was to go take all the books off the bookshelves and box them up and you know, try to determine what books we were going to keep, what books we weren't going to keep. And I was pulling these books off the bookshelf and I came across one book and it had a, a brown paper bag covering on it. And so I needed to decide what box it was going to go in. So I started opening up the book and you know, I realized that Grandma had a... Uh, a book on how to have sex. And the worst part was, like, the copyright date wasn't that long ago. Like, this was a new book that my grandma had picked up. And I'll be completely honest with you, there was a part of me, like, I threw up in my mouth a little bit. Like, it was gross. I mean, let's just be honest here. But you know, 
There was another part of me as their grandson. It was very endearing to me. And it's so weird, I know, and it seems gross to me, and it's awkward, I know. But for your family and for your kids, they need you to have a healthy sex life. And I believe the way that happens is through sex becoming worship. And, and, and if you are, are married, here are some things, and if you're not married, I also want you to hear this, because I want you to hear what sex can look like and what it can be like and how amazing it can be. You know, for my wife and I, sex tips from Michael Cooper, you guys want to get out a sheet of paper and write all these down. For, for my wife and I, a couple of years ago, um, we started to make a decision that, you know, whenever we were intimate in our, our marriage bed, that no longer were we just going to simply have sex with two of us, but we were always going to invite somebody else in. And you know, regularly, what we started doing is we started making prayer incorporated in because what we found out is because, you know, we had the same issues that so many of you do where sex is God and sex is gross. And what we found out is that we were trying to hide what we were doing from God because for some reason we thought what we were doing was bad and gross or, or something that, that we put on a level of God and we didn't want God to be involved. And you know... It's amazing what happens whenever you start praying. But before and bringing God and asking God and Jesus to be involved within your sexual life. Something else that we started doing, this is so weird, and for some of you this is going to seem really awkward, but it's amazing. Is we went from like instead of playing like jazz music and Nora Jones and all that kind of stuff, we started playing worship songs. And what started to happen is we started changing the way that we saw each other, the way we interacted with each other. And no longer was this a God issue, no longer was this a gross issue, but our marriage bed became a bed of worship. And as we were together, we were worshiping God in that moment. And and church family, this is an area, if you are doing anything that is not an act of worship for you, that you cannot turn it into an act of worship, then chances are it is a sin. And too many of us, you are having sex in such a way with somebody that you shouldn't be and spending time in their bed, or they're spending time in your bed that they shouldn't be, and you know that it's a sin, and the very idea of bringing God into it seems wrong because you know that you are living in sin. If that's the case for you, you need to stop. If you are in a healthy marriage relationship, then what you need to start working to do is finding a way to bring God in and make Him involved within that aspect of your life. And for some of you, it's going to feel weird. And if it feels weird, that's because you have an inappropriate view of sex. But the reality is, as you bring Jesus, as you bring God involved, and as you have worship music going in the background, and as you are spending time in prayer, doing some of the most intimate moments with your spouse, then you are telling God that you are involved in every aspect of our life. And as we are bonding together, it isn't just simply my wife and me, but it's you as well. And, you know, there is no category of our lives where we take our lives and say, you know, I give this to Jesus, I give this to my work, I give this to my spouse, and I give this to my wedding bed. God is supposed to be intimately involved in every single aspect of your life. And too often we've categorized them, and what we've done is we've taken sex and we said, you know, sex is gross, sometimes sex is good, and sex may be God and bad for other people. But in all those, we haven't allowed God, we haven't allowed Jesus to be involved in it. And church family, if you hear anything today, young people, sex within the confines of marriage is very strong, very powerful. It can unite you and your wife together, but the decisions you make today are going to impact the strength of that bond. And like Bill was saying earlier, you can do things to make it look okay, but if sex is God for you, that bond's not going to be as strong as it's supposed to be because there is only one God. 
And, and young people, save yourself for that marriage situation. Whenever you do, it will bind you and your spouse together and you will be able to come one flesh through that. If you are married, my encouragement to you is not to categorize Jesus outside of your marriage bed. Be involved with each other regularly and make Jesus part of it. And it will change your intimate aspects of your marriage life and it will make them stronger and it will make them more powerful. Trust me on this. Trust me on this. And for many of you, you're coming from all sorts of different sexual backgrounds, from sexual abuse, and there's a lot of things that stem from it. Do not be afraid to seek out help. Do not be afraid to come and talk to somebody. I'm your pastor, and this is a serious, significant area of your life and of your marriage life. And if there's some things there that are struggling, you, maybe some past, maybe somebody did something to in your past that's still bothering you today. Maybe you've experienced some things, things in the past that maybe they're still bothering you today. Come and talk with somebody. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to help you using scripture in order to understand who Christ is. And this isn't just a area over here that's something that we'd like to be good, like to be nice. This is a significant area of your life. Talk with somebody. I'd love to talk with you. I know we have Pastor Ken. He would love to talk with you as well. You know, you may feel embarrassed. You may feel ashamed, but don't play around with this area of your life and don't let this area of your life to become something that drags your marriage down. Don't. But in every aspect of your life, make it an act of worship and include Jesus.